Welcome to the program today. My name is Mondo Gonzalez here in studio with a prophecy update. And what we've been doing here recently is bringing in some of our guests or Skyping with them, those that are going to be speaking at our conference. And we have over 800 people coming uh, to hear 25 different speakers. It's going to be an awesome time in Colorado Springs. Uh, for those of you that can't make it, we are uh, inviting you to join our streaming. Uh, if you go to prophecywatchers.com, scroll down, you can see the banner there as it relates to the streaming option where you'll get access to all these speakers plus a whole bunch of bonuses. But today we have David Schnigger. Welcome. It's good to be here, Mondo. And you are going to be speaking at the conference on a couple different topics. And before we go there, kind of share with our audience a little bit about yourself. What, who are you? Where can people find out more about you? And kind of give us an insight. Well, the Lord led me uh, back in 2015 to begin a new ministry, Southwest Prophecy Ministries, located right here in Oklahoma City. Uh, we're an independent ministry. We're premillennial, pre-tribulational, dispensational. And uh, basically, we focus on uh, two things, current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. Uh, we tend to be fairly patriotic too, so we get into the realm of politics uh, here and there and try to relate that to God's end time program. We do uh, uh, podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, produce a monthly um, article that we send out to our mailing list. And uh, every once in a while, I get inspired to write a book. Very nice. And so, and uh, I will say occasionally I get opportunities to speak at the Prophecy Watchers mm -hmm. Conference, which has been a real blessing. Yeah. I mean, we have uh, such a great uh, time that we live in to have all these prophecy teachers that are researching and, and really iron sharpens iron. You know, the scripture tells us. Um, let, I want to add, here's a question because we, we get this often and I think that there, it requires a delicate balance. Uh, you mentioned the idea of engaging in, you know, certainly theological um, pursuits, as well as bringing in the political. So that's a big dance, you know, and uh, I think some people, uh, they fall into the, the categories of, well, either you're Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, and certainly as a pastor, um, I don't really care so much about the 501c3 stuff. We're going to preach God's word. But I think oftentimes people hear politics and they say, you should never speak about that. Um, what's your uh, particular approach or philosophy towards bringing in, um, again, theology, the biblical word, and then as politics is one of the categories? I think of the uh, Old Testament prophets as a pattern for this. And of course, Old Testament prophets would talk, talk about future events, mm -hmm. Isaiah, etc., Jeremiah. But they also um, comment, commented on and weighed in on the moral issues of their day. So they not only foretold future events, but they foretold regarding the moral and spiritual evils of their day. And though I don't claim the gift of being a prophet, mm -hmm. I think that's a good pattern. And um, so, some would say, for example, you know, this idea that you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. Well, I think that proclaimers of God's word need to be of earthly good. And that sometimes that involves rebuking mm -hmm. the culture and exposing evil. And when I do so, I don't do it in a partisan way. I'm not a Republican hack. I'm not a Democrat hack. I'm an, uh, I like to think of myself as a God-loving, Bible-believing person who is occupying until Jesus comes. And sometimes that involves delivering bad news, mm -hmm. uh, i.e. exposing the evil in our world today. And of course, that bleeds into the political realm because in my opinion, some of the most evil people on this earth are politicians. Yeah. Of both parties. Of both parties. I mean, you know, that's really important here because, I mean, a lot of people, um, they, they will be critical and they'll say, oh, you guys are, you know, totally blind to Trump or you guys are totally blind to Obama. I've seen it both ways through the years. And um, we, we recognize that, uh, again, as you mentioned, these moral issues. I mean, John the Baptist spoke about moral issues against, you know, King Herod and Jesus spoke about moral issues. So it's our job to speak about moral issues. And if it comes... We criticize Trump, we'll criticize Biden, we'll criticize, again, from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, if we are putting our trust and faith in any politician, we're in trouble. <laughs> so right. th they aren't our heroes. We recognize that all politicians are flawed. If we're going to be involved, we have to make the base the Scripture, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, I don't think that we can really accurately talk about Bible prophecy without commenting on the day in which we live. Because, you know, it's, uh, the hand and the glove are beginning to move together. And I think we're able to see the outlines 
of things that will come to fruition uh, in the tribulation. Uh, and a very simple example of that is the, the casteist society that uh, uh, Revelation 13 talks about. Yeah. That's really a casteist society. So when we hear about a digital currency, the elimination of cash in our day, it's like, well, we have to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and when we see the events of our day, which to me are engineering an end time scenario or what I call the antichrist system, we would be negligent not to comment on those things and not, you know, not get into the date setting aspect of things. But it's like, it's like we are moving inexorably toward the end times that the Bible has predicted. And to me, it's just a testimony to the inerrancy of God's word. None of this catches him by surprise. It shouldn't catch us by surprise. We shouldn't be discouraged because God has laid it all out. It doesn't mean that we, uh, you know, cooperate with it or have a, a attitude of fatalism, but it just means that the days are short and everything that, and we don't know everything because God hasn't revealed everything, but what he has revealed belongs to us. We should examine these things and say, you know what? We're getting awful close to the tribulation period. And so we must believe that our deliverance is coming very soon. That's a very good point. I mean, oftentimes, you know, you might have heard this from, from friends or family if you are a, a prophecy watcher in that regard. And, and some people say, well, why do you guys spend so much time talking about these events in the tribulation period and trying to get down to the nitty gritty if you're pre-tribulational and you don't believe you're going to be there? And you go, well, hold on a minute. I mean, our heart is evangelism. It's education. Um, it's to see people saved. And we recognize that... Um, not everybody that is listening has put their faith in Jesus and we're planting seeds that if the rapture does happen, they're going to go, man, I remember watching that program one time mm -hmm. and I remember now some of the details. So it's, it's appropriate to always speak in thinking of the broadest terms. Mm -hmm. But in that regard, uh, your book, The Pattern of Divine Deliverance, what you're going to be speaking on at the conference, kind of give us a little insight of what, where you're going with that. Well, this all began in November of 2016 with the unlikely election of Donald Trump. And I'd come to the point, to be honest, Mondo, where I'd basically given up on America. You know, after eight years of Obama, it's like, we are lost. And so, you know, uh, and I heard Donald Trump during his campaign, it's like, there's something refreshingly different about him. And I didn't expect him to win, uh, but he did. And it got me to thinking about the whole subject of divine deliverance. So for the last six years, I've been meditating on that. And then about four years ago, I started researching examples of divine deliverance in the Bible and in church history. Uh, and the fruit of that is his book. And in the process of doing that, again, the springboard being the unlikely election of Donald Trump, uh, I think that there is a pattern of divine deliverance in the Bible that uh, should be an encouragement to all of us as believers. And one, one aspect of that pattern, I'm not sure I'll give the whole pattern away because I want people to come to the conference, yep. is that in each case, God used an unlikely person. And we'll just talk about Donald Trump, you know, thrice married, casino yep. owner, you know, kind of a, 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 not a reputation of being a righteous man. So this is extremely flawed individual in, in anybody's category. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And when we think of other deliverers, for example, the first chapter of my book has to do with the Exodus deliverance. Mm -hmm. Well, Moses was a murderer. Yep. He murdered an Egyptian and then he fled for his life for 40 years. And then he argued with God about going back to Israel. He flat did not want to do it. So he was very Excuse unlikely. Maker, yep. He was. He was unlikely. He was unwilling. He was a stutterer by his own, mm -hmm. you know. But yet he affected one of the greatest deliverances in the Bible. Yeah. And I have a chapter on Jonah in Nineveh. Well, we all know about Jonah, you know, when God called him. In one direction, he went the other direction, had to get a three-day memory lesson <laughs> in, the, in, in the belly of the great fish. Yep. Jonah was a very unlikely deliverer. And on and on it goes. And so the encouragement I got in doing this research is that God uses unlikely people. And in our heart of hearts, at least I believe I'm very unlikely. Yeah. And, and very, it's like, why would God use me? I know what a great sinner I am. Yep. So God uses unlikely people in his providential sovereign plan, sometimes to affect great deliverances. And so that's really the heart of my book. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about really recently and is th this whole word of the word pattern. Yeah, you see this in Luke chapter 17, verse 30, where Jesus 
is describing the, the days of the Son of Man and his return. And he says this is going to follow the pattern, using that word, that, that language there, of Noah as well as Lot. And so I appreciate that uh, what God is doing. And Jesus gives us the uh, authority, n- not that it's dogmatic, in, in, but to look for these patterns. Because mm-hmm. Jesus himself did, and he set the example for us, that the patterns for the end of the age are really, uh, uh, or the, the, the theology of the end of the age fo- is Jesus used word, follow these patterns. Mm-hmm. So when you come to scripture, you know, the pattern of divine deliverance, what, 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 is, what is a divine deliverance? Can it, let's uh-huh. define, I like defining words or phrases. Well, as I look at the Bible, there are two types of divine deliverances. There are direct deliverances, such as we see when the angel of death swept through the camp of Sennacherib. 185,000 soldiers died. That was a direct deliverance. When we think about the future, Ezekiel 38 and 39, when the forces of Gog and Magog uh, sweep upon Israel, God will directly intervene and he will take care of matters. So there are times when God directly intervenes without our help or consent. The second coming is an example of that. We're not going to contribute to that. We don't vote on it. God just comes and he does it, you know, in Christ. But then there are indirect deliverances. And those tend to be more common in the scripture and in church history, where God uses people uh, as his instruments, imperfect instruments, unlikely, but he uses people. And as we look back, we say that person was instrumental or pivotal in that divine deliverance, such as Exodus, you know, with Moses. Uh, Nineveh, King Cyrus, the unlikely person who, you know, with his decree allowed the people of Judah to go back and rebuild. So, and then I trace some in church history. We have George Washington at Valley Forge, rather unlikely, a man of British descent who actually fought alongside the British and he becomes the deliverer. Uh, Then we have Winston Churchill at uh, the Battle of Dunkirk, a man who was really a backbencher during the 1930s, but in a time of desperation, they bring him into the prime minister's position. He calls for a day of prayer. And then the folks get in their boats and dinghies and yachts and rescue over 300,000 soldiers off the shores of Dunkirk. Otherwise, they would have lost, the World War II would have been lost in May of 1940. So you have this pattern of very unlikely people, sometimes very unlikable people, who God, you know, pulls out of the crowd at just that moment of desperation and says, I'm going to use you to do something amazing. And so those are the stories that I tell in the book. This is, I mean, to me, as you're watching this and and we think about uh, even this upcoming conference, you know, Homeward Bound, I mean, um, we... We talk about prophecy, and prophecy recognizes, as Jesus said, the, the difficulties, perilous times will come, as Paul said, right? So, but it's not, it's not without hope. It's not without encouragement. And I think that what, what I'm getting from you here is and what you're going to talk is you're gonna ha- it's going to be a message of hope and encouragement? Yes, it is. That's my heart. And um, again, I think in, in the, the last days, particularly I think with what we're going through as Americans over the last year and a half, and I don't think I need to fill in the blanks on that. It's easy to get discouraged, Mondo, and to think, well, all is lost. You know, we only have dark days ahead as a nation. There's nothing we can do. And I think that's the devil's trick. You know, he, he's the source of discouragement, dismay. And God is a God of encouragement. And my hope is that these stories will encourage us You know, wherever we're at, wherever God has placed us to be an instrument of deliverance, whether it be in our family, our place of work, in our neighborhood, that God can tap us on the shoulder and say, you know, I think you need to go in this direction. And for example, I know some Christian people who have never run for office before that are are running for school board. I have a a man that I met recently. He's running for the United States Senate. He's a 30-year-old Pentecostal preacher. He's never done anything politically, but God tapped him on the shoulder and said, you need, you need to step up. So I think the days in which we live should encourage us to be on our knees, to ask God to use us as his instruments. Uh, so a lot of this is built upon that very familiar text, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, we're his people, which are called by his name, you know, will call upon him, pray, turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and will deliver and heal our land. And I believe that individually and collectively, we can, we can be part of that. Amen, amen. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to bring in the kingdom. I'm not, you know, a post-millennial or any of that. Yeah. 
But in the day in which we live, he wants us to occupy until he comes. And he can do anything he wants with our lives if we're willing to let him. Yeah, amen. David, appreciate you being here. We look forward to seeing you at the conference in just in a couple of weeks. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it as well. It's going to be great. For those of you that are watching, I mean, the, the goal uh, of us here at Prophecy Watchers, and you can hear it in David's heart as well, those that we brought in to speak is one of encouragement. Um, e even in the midst of dark times, God is not limited. Uh, and as David mentioned, in Luke 19, Jesus tells us to occupy, to do business until he returns. And so uh, until the rapture happens, we are called to preach the gospel, to go out and to encourage uh, morality and to promote righteousness. I mean, that's really what we're here for. And until that day comes, we know that Jesus is always with us. We're going to keep pressing on. And for those that God calls to to step up and to be a part of the political process in order to encourage righteousness as well as promote moral, positive moral issues. So in the meantime, if you have not uh, signed up for the, the streaming, you certainly can do that, prophecywatchers.com. It's going to be a great time. Uh, the great thing about streaming as well uh, is that you won't miss any of the speakers where some people will have to make choices in Colorado Springs. But for you, you'll have the opportunity to get all of them. And so I appreciate you watching today and for this prophecy update. Appreciate David being here. And we will see you at the conference or we'll see you next time.